Good morning, everyone. Beruchim Abayim. Wednesday, the third day of Shivat, corresponding to January 9th, 2019. Today, breakfast and class, graciously sponsored by Mrs. Rachel Alitensi and her son Daniel Alitensi and family, Le'ailu Nishmat, the beloved husband and father, Gershon Ben Nisim, Iratzon, that through the words of Torah and the Berachot, will be an Eilui Neshama, will be an elevation to the soul. Amen. 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 Today's Gemara discusses the topic of feelings. Hurting people's feelings. Obviously, we all know that to hurt people, it's wrong. It's actually, besides being wrong, is a Torah prohibition. But today's topic, it will be talk about talking about hurting people with words, not with actions, not with money or physical, but verbally. And the Gemara begins the introduction, the introduction to this statement is about not embarrassing people publicly. The Gemara writes in the name of Rabbi Shimon Ben Yochai in the Gemara Baba Messiah. לעולם יפיל אדם עצמו לכבשן האש ואל ילבין פני חברו ברבים It is better for the person to be cast into the fire and not to embarrass someone publicly Also we dedicate the class of today for the refuah shelema of Devorah Feige Bat Rezo as well as David ben Aliyah and Yaakov ben Aliza, among all of the Holim of Am Israel. Baruch Atta Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Shehakol Nihiyah Vibaruch. Amen. What proof does the Gemara bring concerning this statement that a rather a person be executed, God forbid, and not embarrassing someone, the famous story of Yehuda and Tamar. When Tamar, the daughter-in-law of Yehuda, was about to be executed for acting in an immoral way, the way the Torah describes in Bereshit, Genesis 38, 25, the Pasuk there says the following, He Musef, She's about to be thrown out, brought out rather for execution, and she sends a message to Yehuda, and saying to Yehuda, whoever owns these items is the father of the baby. Why did she act in that way? If someone is about to be executed for a crime that you did not commit, or that nobody committed, say something, why are you punishing me? You are the father of the baby. But Tamar was very careful of not embarrassing Yehuda in public. And therefore she said, i rather go on, be gone from the world and killing someone by embarrassing the person in public. Obviously, when we talk about Yehuda, Tamar, Sadikim, we're not talking about regular people. We're talking about the relationship that brought the foundation of Mashiach into the world. But the Gemara uses the basic statement of the Perasha to teach us this important lesson. The Gemara continues. Don't hurt your friends. The Gemara uses this concept as the foundation of how a husband should not speak to his wife, should not speak to the wife. We all know that we need to speak nice, but what shouldn't I do when I talk to my wife? The Gemara writes, Amar Rav, Le'olam, Yehe Adam Zahir Be'onaat Ishto, forever, not only in the first year of marriage, not for the first five years, forever, from the moment that you came home from the chupa till the day that God calls either one of them, Yehe Adam Zahir Be'onaat Ishto, a husband 
needs to be careful in not causing, causing suffering to his wife. Because ladies are sensitive and words hurt the wife. She gets hurt rapidly and she cries also. Ladies, and with all the respect to the wonderful ladies listening and watching, this is the way Hashem created the husband and the wife. Sensitivity is something that the Talmud tells us that is applicable to the wife more than to the husband. Sure, the husband should be sensitive, but sensitive in a good way. Sensitive means to also be thoughtful, to be caring, to be concerned, to thinking before speaking, and choosing the words that will not cause, God forbid, an internal damage to the emotions and to the tears of the wife. The Gemara, talking about words, talks about that there is one area of tears which is, I don't want to say encouraged, but acceptable. And this is when a person prays. Although we have a kelal, we have a rule, that when a person prays, should pray with happiness, but sometimes a person may be afflicted or affected by a certain situation, if it's refuah shelema, or an issue of shalom bayit, or a difficulty in parnasah, and the person sheds some tears during the prayer, the Gemara says that sometimes we pray and there is no much reaction from the heavens. Why is that? Many reasons. Maybe the heaven answer us no and we're not happy with that answer. Or maybe Shammai made a decree that cannot be reversed. But the Gemara writes clearly that there is one gate of prayer that is always open, never closes. Sha'are dima'a. The gates of tears. As David Melech writes in the book of Tehillim, Lev nishvar benitke Elohim lotibze Zipche lokim ruach nishvara. These two pesukim are connected in the book of Tehillim and it says the ultimate sacrifice is the actual spirit of the person. But Hashem will never reject a person that prays from the depths of the heart. He prays with a certain level of anguish, etc. The Gemara goes even further discussing that victims of pain Victims of suffering, they have a special place in heaven. In what sense? The Gemara writes clearly, Many times a person prays and nothing happens. But the Gemara writes that a person that prays to Hashem has a victim, meaning to say a person prays to Hashem God, look, I got, I got hurt. At whatever level, Bore Olam pays attention to the one that suffers. Continues the Gemara, and the Gemara brings a pasu from the Amos, yeah. and it says, Amar Rabbi El Azar, Hakol Nifra'a Bidei Shaliyah, Chutz Me'ona'a. Gemara goes even further. What happens when a person, for example, ate without saying beracha? It's an avon. We already know this. But how God collects from the person? Because at the end of the day, when a person does a mitzvah, there is a reward, there is a benefit. Amen. And when a person does an avon, what is there? A consequence. <coughs> Let's put it in plain English. And I don't want to frighten anyone, especially those watching. Punishment. There is reward and punishment. So you know what the Gemara writes? 
that any sin, any transgression that a person may have made throughout his life, God waits, God sends a shaliyah to collect from the person with one exception. Causing pain and suffering to others, God says, I take care of the matter myself. Scary statement. And that's what the Gemara says. Amar Rabbi Azar, Hakol, for all the sins that a person did. Nifra b'inmenu akadosh baruchu b'ide shaliyah. God sends a messenger. Chutz me'ona'a, shenifra mimenu be'atzmo, be'eno mishtahe. There is one more challenge that God doesn't wait a very long time to collect from someone that hurts people. You know where else we see this concept? Hilul Hashem. When a person desecrates God's name. Let's continue the Gemara. There are three situations that Shamaim pay very much attention to. Ona'a, causing pain and suffering to others, and this is including financial pain, physical, and verbal. Gezel, stealing, because we're causing pain and suffering to others. And Aboda Zara, idolatry. Why? Because this is a direct attack against HaKadosh Baruch Hu. It's like you are married and your wife asks you, where are you going? I'm going on a date. <laughs> Shiduch. Can you imagine ever saying that? Myself. Don't get any ideas. One way. Myself. <laughs> One way out. One way. Don't come back. <laughs> <laughs> this is what Abu Dazara means. We are connected with God. And we're telling God, you know what? I'm going to try somebody else. A different God. But since Baruch Hashem is an issue that is in the world even minimized compared to the way it was in the olden days, let's finish one more time with the topic of how a husband speaks to the wife. Amar Rebi Halabo. Le'olam hi adam zahir b'chvodishto. Forever a husband needs to be careful in the way he honors his wife. Because the main source of blessing of in the home, it comes on the merit of the wife. And the Gemara concludes, the Pasuk writes, the Amar Lehu said to the people of his town, Honor your wives, in order for you to become wealthy. And therefore, since the Gemara is telling us, sin quanon, non-negotiable, that the blessing in the home comes in the merit of the wife, so therefore it says, a husband has a mandatory obligation to honor the wife, has a karatato, has gratitude. And in this zehud, when a husband is grateful to the wife, so when Olam sees that the wife is happy, and the wife is happy, that brings more and more biraka into the uh, home of the person. Okay? Very interesting, very interesting concept that the Mefashim brings in this particular Gemara from Gemara Baba Messiah 59a. So, someone in the early class, someone... Can you, um, yes, maybe translation is required. There is a lack of communication because they don't speak the same language. That's the relationship between husband and wife. You know, they speak English, but they don't speak English. They speak against each other. So somebody said before, Rabbi, my wife doesn't respect me. Somebody made this comment in the early class. And he said to him, do you respect your wife? Sometimes. I said, with that type of answer, I understand why your wife doesn't respect you. So what, Rabbi? This is very simple. You get what you give. 
That's it. You treat your wife respectfully. As the Gemara says, avoid making the wife crying. Now you may say, Rabbi, ladies cry all the time. And the Gemara said it, the opening statement. Be careful, mitoch shedim ata mesuya. It's very easy for a lady to bring out tears. So if it's so easy for a wife to cry, so what does the Gemara is telling us? You need to think three times before you say something. Even if you're going to say something nice, you need to put the proper sentence. Fine tune it. Hazako, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. To fine tune it so it's delivered with the same kavana that you had when you say it. So, you know what? <clears throat> Bottom line. Respect, and I think that everybody will agree on this, is a mandatory asset to have in a relationship. And the more respect we give, the more respect we get. You can, we cannot demand respect. What they tell you in school, you have to earn respect. And how do you earn respect? Respecting. By respecting others. That's it. In English they say, what goes around, comes around. What does that mean? You want to get, you have to give. Boomerang. Boomerang effect. Mida keneged mida. But if a person, or if a husband is going to say, when she starts, I start. Believe me, you already lost, you already lost for knockout. You will not make it. Why not? Because you have, you have an expectation that in the reality of life, although it could be some exceptions, the reality is mirror image. A mirror image. Husband and wife are mirrors. In what sense? Not in the physical sense only, but on the emotional sense. As I mentioned yesterday, and actually there is a pasuk from Shalomo HaMelech that says, Kamaim apanim el apanim ken lev ha'adam el ha'adam. It says, let's say that I'm looking at the mirror. Let's make believe the phone is like a mirror. I'm looking at the mirror of the phone. Oh, nice tie today. <laughs> nice. Very nice. Mm. Smiling. So what happens now? I'm smiling at the mirror. What does the mirror do? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. No, not here. It's not in this room. No. Thank you. So what happens? I smile. Sm life smiles back at me. Same thing with the wife. If we look at the wife as the mirror, guess what? This is going to be a recipe for success. This is what the books of Shalom Bayit talks about it at length. That many times the wife becomes God's mouthpiece. Speaker of God. Now, many ladies, many ladies listening to this, they may feel very good. So does it mean, Rabbi, that I am God in the home? The short answer is yes and no. Yes, because the Shekhinah aspect represents the female aspect of Hashem. There is Hashem and there is Shekhinah. The Shekhinah is what comes to the house of a person. A person wants to attract the Shekhinah. What's the meaning of Shekhinah? No Shekhinah. Shekhinah means next door neighbor in Hebrew. I'm talking about Shekhinah. Shekhinah means from dwelling. You want to create our home to become a magnetic field for God to dwell with us? It must exist Shalom. But when God forbid the husband makes comments or complaints or doesn't say things that really remedy the situation, but it causes crying, bitterness, etc. What are we doing? We hurting ourselves. We hurting our spouses. It's like somebody said the other day, why you hear many times, and this is going to be a message to the wonderful <laughs> ladies as well. 
although perhaps will be better if it comes from a female speaker, but since we're talking about Shalom Bayit, so I feel, you know, comfortable enough to say it. Many times we hear that men, God forbid, involve themselves in forbidden relationships. God forbid, it should never happen. But as a rabbi, unfortunately, sometimes I become aware of these situations. And not long ago, I had a situation with a lady. Not me, Baruch Hashem. But a lady had a situation with a man. What was the situation? That this man started to compliment her. That simple. Guess what? Her husband never complimented her. Now she feels good. Now she feels honored. Now she feels, wow, somebody is noticing me. Obviously, as soon as the problem was found, Baruch Hashem is in the road to recovery, if you understand my drift. Let's go on the opposite side. Why sometimes you hear, and I hope that you never hear of this, but unfortunately, I've heard cases like this in the past. How could it be that Yehudim, Jewish men, sometimes, whoever they are, whoever they are, if he's a professional or a businessman, suddenly get involved with a secretary, <coughs> get involved with an employee, non-Jewish employee. How could it be? He has a kosher wife at home, beautiful children, and suddenly they became involved with a boya, with a secretary, with an assistant. How could it be? You know, want to know the main answer that I heard? from rabbis, speakers, besides the Yeserara. One thing, that the husbands don't get a warm feeling in their homes. And suddenly the Yeserara, as he said so beautifully, starts working on that weakest link. What I'm talking now is to the ladies' department. We gave enough ammunition to the men how to deal with the wife properly, respectfully, in a loving, caring manner. I'm going to speak to the ladies now. Reciprocate. So one lady watching may say, Rabbi, I wish my husband will be here to listen to the first half of the class. <laughs> Feel free to share the class. I don't have copyright on the class, unless you're gonna sell it. Don't sell my classes, God forbid, but feel free to share them. So I think that with the permission of everyone here listening, I'd like to add one more sentence to whatever I said before. Ladies, wives, you know how the Torah calls the wife? Eshet Ha'il. But you know what other title the wife has? Akeret Habayit. The foundation of the home. But the word Akeret in Hebrew has three <laughs> meanings. Akeret from Eka, the main, the backbone of the home, the foundation of the home. Akara it's also a word in Hebrew concerning a barren wife. A wife that, God forbid, has medical issues and doesn't allow her to become pregnant. <coughs> but in Hebrew, akeret is also the root word la'akor, the one that uproots the house, the one that destroys the house. <coughs> Same word. Just play with the vowels. Akeret, akor. Same letters. One is a builder, one is a destroyer. So how do we build a home? I think the answer is in the Shiva Berachot. 
First, Sameah Tesamah. You need to be happy yourself before you make someone else happy. This blessing is one of the seven blessings that we say under the chuppah. So you're ready in the chuppah, you are being told, Sameah Tesamah. Is actually, this beracha is based on a pasuk of the Torah that says, Besimach et ishto. There is a Torah obligation for the husband to make his wife happy. Let's go to the next part. It's a pasuk. Ahava ve'ahva shalom bere'ud. Ahava is love. Love, ahava, the middle letters of the word love is in Hebrew, have. Have means to give. Meaning to say a husband must be a giver. And when I'm saying being a giver, I'm not referring only on the physical way or in the financial way. But I'm talking about on the word of Ahava, love, meaning to say a husband must show love, caring, friendship, love, and harmony. These are words that they must exist in a relationship. And now I'm going to talk to the ladies. Yes, we know, dear ladies, that the man has more work to do than a wife in a marriage. Because he needs to do a lot of things. But that doesn't mean that a wife should say, when he changes, I'm going to change. Because wives have more power than they believe they have. I tell you some tips that it says in the books of Shalom Bayit for the ladies. Sometimes the ladies feel that I speak more to the men than to the ladies. So today I'm going to speak to the ladies something that we learn in our Shalom Bayit class for couples a few weeks ago. And one of the topics there says that when a husband comes home the wife should not bombard the husband as soon as he comes in. Also, the husband cannot come home like a bully. And, okay, what did you do all day? Why dinner is not on the table? All these comments don't help the relationship. Don't help the relationship. Come in, how was your day? Call before you get there, like I mentioned in the past. At least the wife is ready for the husband when he comes in. Some ladies want to honor the husband and love the husband so much that if dinner is not ready when the husband comes home, they feel bad. I know this from professional experience. That's a beautiful feeling that the wife feels bad that dinner is not ready. But the husband also needs to be hacham and don't say, why dinner is not ready tonight? You know, there are comments that we need to avoid. But also the wife, you want to talk to your husband about an issue? Let me look at the camera because there is an all male audience in the room. So probably there is, could be some female audience watching or listening virtually. So when your husband comes home, home needs to be a place of shalom. That there are challenges that happen throughout the day, of course. We all have challenges. There is no such a thing that a person does not have challenges at home. But this reminds me of a Spanish statement that says, Estomago lleno, corazón contento. When your stomach is full, your heart is happy. You know what the Gemara writes about breakfast? The Gemara talks the import, about the importance of breakfast. Pachahrit and is able to prevent 83 diseases that affect the internal organs of the human body. But you know what the Gemara writes? Mori de takin'a umosifeta ahava. Removes jealousy and increases love. In plain English, crankiness happens often because our stomach is empty. So the Gemara says, you want to start your day in a proper way? Pray 
have breakfast, learn, and then go to work. This way, even when you go to work, the fact that you have something in your stomach, your body is happy. Your body is content. Same thing at home. Dinner time. Don't make a dinner time the moment of arguments because the food becomes lehem ha'asavim, the pasuk says. The food becomes poison. God forbid. Nobody wants to eat poison. And sometimes the poison is not the food, God forbid. It's actually the environment of the food. That's why you can notice the difference if the one cooking was happy or was upset. Where do we learn this from? From the concept of baking halal. When ladies bake halal, for those who know, there are kavanot in every item that you add into the mixture to make halal. When you put flour, when you put oil, when you put water, when you put yeast, when you put salt or seasoning, whatever recipe you do, and the ladies probably know this more than men, and all the Judaica bookstores today, they sell it, books about challah, prayers for challah, and in every time an ingredient is being put into the tray, there is a special kavanah. That's one of the main ingredients why the halot in our homes come out delicious every week. And it doesn't matter that a recipe was changed or a recipe was tried or could be that the wife may have forgotten to add one component and yet it tastes delicious. Why? Because it's done with happiness. So therefore, dinner time should not be sha'at milhama. Should not be a moment of war. Talk and then mehila eat and then talk. So everybody is more calm and is more relaxed. Obviously, needless to say, that husband and wife should not argue in front of the children. If arguing overall is not good, arguing in front of the children is worse. Because now kids understand. Hey, it's fine. They argue. They res disrespect each other. All that is a domino effect. And in this, what I just said for the past few minutes, it doesn't matter on the gender. Respect is non-negotiable. Respect must exist. If there is no respect between husband and wife, how do you expect to have Shalom Bait? And respecting most of the time is through words, sometimes through actions, but most of the time is through words. This is the message of the Gemara of today from Masechet Baba Kama. Mehila. Masechet Baba Messiah. Aha. Mm hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. You got it? Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Tefillin. The Mizra of Tefillin. That's the topic of the Zohar of today. We all know the Mizra of Tefillin. I'm sure that everybody wears kosher Tefillins. If you have not checked your Tefillin in a few years, definitely send it to check. But today, Tefillin's message is the influence of the Tefillin in the human body. We all know this, that the Tefillin has a particular mission in the life of a person. The Basuk says, Vehaya leot al yadecha ultotafot ben anecha. The Basuk says the Tefillin is an ot, is a symbol is a covenant between us and Akadosh Baruch Hu. What kind of covenant is the Torah referring to? I'm not going to go so deep. I'm going to review quickly one particular topic in the Mizvah of Tefillin. Besides that the Tefillin must be kasher, 
and it contains the four perashiot in which two of them are found in this week's Torah portion. But let's talk about the strategic location of the tefillin. The tefillin needs to be calibrated. In what sense? We have Allahic guidelines for the proper placement of tefillin, right? The tefillin of the hand, okay, needs to be put in the middle of the muscle. Let's make believe that this is the tefillin, okay? So, the tefillin needs to be turned sideways, pointing towards my heart. Why? Because the tefillin gets like a wireless connection, a Wi-Fi connection through my heart and Hashem through the tefillin. That's this part of the tefillin. But the tefillin doesn't stay here in the upper arm. The tefillin covers the entire arm and my hand. This represents the actions of the person. Not only the feelings of being a Jew is for the heart, but a person must act as a Jew as well. And then we have the tefillin on the head, which is on top of the upper part of the brain, the highest part of the head, the highest part of the human body is exactly where I put on my tefillin, and the pasuk says, Ben Enecha, it needs to be placed between my eyes, and just one more, the tefillin needs to end by the hairline of the person. Sometimes a person has tefillin, let's say this is the hairline. Sometimes the person has tefillin and it's on the forehead. That's a halakhic problem. And allow me to illustrate this with a example. It's unhappy example, but maybe I'll try to start with a good example. Have you ever heard of GPS? What's the meaning of GPS? Global Positioning System. system. So the tefillin is a GPS. How does the GPS work? The satellite needs to capture the radio wave of the machine. And once they are calibrated, then you are able to get the directions. I'm going to bring maybe a stronger example, unhappy example, but I think it's important. Let's say, God forbid, someone has a medical condition that requires radiation. You know, when it comes to treatment of the illness that starts with the letter C, there are different treatments. One is called chemotherapy, and the other one is called radiation. And I'm sure that there are many varieties in the different types of treatments. And maybe there is more. We hope that the disease disappears. <coughs> Instead of finding cures, remove the disease to begin with. Now, and those affected should have a refuah shelema. Radiation, you know what radiation means? That the professional, the doctor, sends like invisible rays right, to the particular part of the body, the exact location of where the condition is. But in order to do that, they must calibrate the machine that the treatment is in the area where it's needed and not one inch away. You know, it's the same area, same neighborhood. Where do you live in Aventura? What address? A 188 and whatever. That's not walking distance to the shoe. That's three miles. Oh, but it's the same city. But you're not close enough. Understand? Same thing with the tefillin. For the tefillin to have the strong effect in our mind, in our heart, and in our actions, the tefillin needs to be properly placed in the body. Not only that needs to be kasher, but it needs to be properly placed. This is the reason, Be'ezat Hashem, based on today's class, this coming Sunday, we're going to have a few sofrim, I believe, from 7 to 10, that are going to walk around the synagogue, 
and adjust the tefillin for everybody who needs an adjustment. You know, whenever you go to a chiropractor, what do they do? They do an adjustment. Guess what? Tefillin also needs an adjustment. Tefillin needs to be calibrated in the proper way. Besides the checking, obviously. Now, the result of today discusses an interesting pasuk that says, Ve'asita hayashar ve'hatov. And you will do what's correct and what is good. The Zohar Kadosh says, to what is referring to? To the tefillin of the hand and the tefillin of the head. What has to do doing right and doing what's good with the tefillin? I believe that this is the intention of the Zohar of today, of reinforcing how we act as a Jew. There are many people that are not observant and they tell us I'm a good Jew at heart. That's beautiful, but that's not enough. There are other people who act very Jewish. They act Jewish. They come to pray, they learn, they do misbot, they give charity, but guess what? They have a Goyshe cup. <coughs> have you ever heard of this statement? Yeah. Goyshe cup means what? That a person does not have Torah values and ideals. You know what the Zohar is teaching us? That the Mizvah of Tefillin is not only affecting the physical, but is affecting the emotional from the heart and the intellectual from a brain. Like somebody who were talking before in the morning about kosher businesses. And somebody says, since when there is a kosher business? All business is kosher. I said, has shalom. There are businesses that are tarif. For example, Jan, he challenges me. You're lucky it was not recorded. But I tell you, I says, what do you mean? A store that's open on Shabbat is tarif. A store that is not honest in business is tarif. A store that charges interest without a terah iska is tarif. A store that doesn't pay the salaries of the employees on time is tarif. Oh, I never saw it like that. So I said, you know what the problem is? That you think that kosher is only kosher food. Sure, kosher food, kosher tefillin, kosher suits, kosher money, kosher business. There are businesses which are dangerous to the person. Dangerous to do that shamayim of the person. Has the shalom. You understand what I'm talking about? So, of course, the Torah and the tefillin and the mitzvot teaches us that I need to be a good soldier all around. Did you ever see someone that came from wars? If they came from Vietnam or the new thing from Iraq, from Afghanistan, from Pakistan, from the Gulf. You ever see how they take a haircut? They take a military haircut, even though they are past that. Or how they talk. Yes, sir. No, sir. Thank you, sir. Why? Because they are programmed to act and to function in this way. Guess what? Every Jew, every Yehudi, is a soldier in the army of Hashem. It's actually a pasuk in the parasha that says, Tzivot Hashem. We are the army of God. We are the ambassadors of God. How many times people eat kasher, they pray three times a day, but when it comes to business, they have a different shulchan aruch. I'm allowed because he did it to me. Since when vengeance is permissible. And sometimes you'll be surprised. Most of the times that I had to solve or to settle financial disputes was with people that have apparently a proper Jewish way of life. But through the world of business you discover 
that it was only the external. And the Jewish cup and the Jewish way of thinking. And when I mean Jewish, I don't mean like somebody told me the other day, my mama told me, always get a Jewish lawyer because they're always smart. Okay, we're not talking about that. We're talking about thinking with a Torah mindset. Is it okay what I'm about to do? Is it permissible what I'm about to do? Is it kosher what I'm about to do? This is what the Zohar says. Hayashar behatov. What's proper? Not proper in your eyes. Be'aynei Hashem elokecha. Does God give the approval or not? If God doesn't give it to you, toidnisht, as they say. Forget about it. As they say in Brooklyn, if you ever drive to the Belt Parkway, go into JFK, right? There is a banner that says what? Forget about it. Forget about it. That's a New York way of saying forget about it. In Florida will be forget about it. In New York will be forget about it. Like a made up word, so to speak. The Pasuk says, Not in my eyes. What's proper? Will God approve of this behavior or not? And I know that somebody may say, Rabbi, it's impossible. So I cannot do anything. Hasve Shalom. You can do a lot of things. But just do it between the parameters of halakha. And if you don't know, ask. I'll finish with a story that happened here in Miami 25 years ago. Somebody immigrated from South America and a person in his homeland or home country was always in sales. Good salesman. Give him something to sell, he was able to sell it for you. That good this person was. He comes as a rabbi, I received now my working papers, can you help me find a job? So, okay, I listened. I made an announcement in the synagogue after prayers. Anybody that have a sales position available in their business, please let me know. I may have someone reliable. Beautiful. I made the introduction. The next day, the person says, Rabbi, I need to find a different job. I said, why? Why? Wasn't good the job that I found for you? He says, it was good for money, but it was dangerous for my neshama. He says, what do you mean? Were you selling non-kosher food? No. He says, what were you selling? Ladies' garments without semi-old. And I needed to go, he tells me, to South Beach. In those days, South Beach was the epicenter of Tum'ah. I don't know what is there today. But for those of you who remember, South Beach used to be very Jewish. Then it became like very problematic. And then it became very hip, etc. Today, I don't know if it's still there, but don't go to check it out. And it says, the line of business, all the customers were in South Beach. And it says, my yeserara was bothering me so much that I had to make a decision. My yeserara or my neshama. Because he needed to go to stores that were spiritually challenging and the environment, you can understand what I'm trying to say. So the long story short, uh, Baruch Hashem, he gave up that job that promised to be very, very good. And Baruch Hashem, a week later, he found a normal job that his values as a Jew are not compromised. And this is what the message of the Zohar of today is. It says many times, and I'm going to say to the ladies something as well. We gave to the men a lot today. I'm going to say something to the ladies. Baruch Hashem, there is, I like to say, a improvement overall when it comes to the topic of semiot modesty people dressing in a modest fashion in a proper way but I think and don't take this as a rebuke but just as a friendly reminder 
Semi'ut, modesty, is not only on the dress code. It's not only on the length of the sleeves or on the length of the skirt or wearing socks or covering the hair. That is semi'ut on the external body, so to speak. And even that sometimes is challenging. But we'll leave it for some other day. But semi'ut is also how a person speaks, how a person talks. We don't raise the voice in public. We don't speak like ordinary people. We speak pleasantly, respectfully. Husband to wife, wife to husband, couple to parents, and individuality. And that's also a semi'ut aspect. The Pasuk says, Be'asne'a lechet im elokecha. A person that has semi'ut, a lady that has semi'ut, cannot be friendly to men. And something that sometimes we see. A person dresses with semi'ut, <laughs> but then suddenly sees a man, and hugs a man, and kisses a man. Socially, nothing forbidden. But we need to understand that modesty, seniot, is a way of life. At all levels. For men and for women. And that's what the Pasuk says. God loves modesty. Because modesty brings humility, brings irachamayim, and brings a tremendous amount of closeness to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. My dear friends, I'd like to wish everybody to have a lovely day. Baruch Adonai Le'olea.